It's good to see you this morning at Emma Mills Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here, and uh, we look forward to the blessings of the Lord on the service this morning. We had a great uh, service at 10 o'clock, a good number there, and a great message uh, from Reverend Haynes. Um, just want to remind you, prayer and coffee is every Monday at 8 o'clock, so please remember that. If you can't come, you can certainly pray wherever you are uh, during that time. And don't forget our youth have begun meeting again. They meet on Wednesdays at 645 and uh, meet outside, meet in different locations. So you can follow up with Griffin on that. He'll be glad to talk to you about the youth meeting, okay? There's a new ladies Bible study uh, being started uh, on Monday, September 14th at 7 o'clock. And if you ac have access to a computer, of course, and uh, or know about Zoom, this is something you may be interested in. So it'll be online. You can call the church office or... Uh, talk to Susan Moon or Paulette Hill, and they'll be glad to give you some more information about that. Okay. Let's go ahead and sing our chorus together this morning, Ancient Words, and let's stand together and sing that. The words are printed in your bulletin. open we'll sing stand up stand up for Jesus to have our prayer time in just a moment right before the message. Reverend Hames will uh, bring you the prayer list and updates on that, and then he will have prayer. I'm going to sing for you a song this morning, day by day and with each passing moment, and the days we face today, and, and pretty much in any time. Uh, there are always trials and tribulations that come, uh, but we have the Word of God that says, praise be to the Lord who daily bears our burdens, and we're thankful that as God's children, we can claim that spiritual truth. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. 
truly is a blessing to me to be able to be here with you in this wonderful place today. Thank you for being here. We had a great group in our 10 o'clock service. In fact, is the uh, place was about filled, and uh, now we have the blessing of you in this service. Thank you for coming. Let's to go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to come into the house of the Lord and to find the love of Jesus Christ in the hearts and the lives of those who are here. I pray, Lord, that you will suit a blessing for each person that has come, that they will be able to go away from this service strengthened in the Lord and inspired to serve the Lord. Now, Father, we pray for those who have need this morning. We realize that there are various kinds of needs in this day, and I do pray that you will minister to each one as they look to you and trust you. And now, Father, I do pray that you'll help me to share the Word of God in a spirit of love as we are called to do in the Word of God, and that this service will be one that will honor you and we'll be able to leave knowing that we truly have been in the Lord's house. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Would you stand in honor of God's holy word? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Wow, that's a statement, isn't it? And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. What a statement. The love of Jesus Christ for one another is more important than anything else. How about that? Thank you. You may be seated. Ours is probably the most challenging time to be a living, breathing Christian that I have known. I've lived a lot of years. But I do believe these are the toughest times right now to live out the Christian life and to understand what's going on in our world about us. I uh, have a couple of illustrations, but I came across a living illustration yesterday concerning love. 
Love is more than just talking. Love is more than just good, sweet sound. Love is something that is willing to go the whole way because of your love and care for someone. A pastor that I knew years ago, a pastor of one of the great churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, was called to be a leader in the Southern Baptist Convention. And so he resigned his church and accepted the position and honored that position with a great deal of hard work and was very successful in that position. Uh, he and his wife were servants in that position for quite a number of years, but then their health began to be a problem. He was in the hospital a time or two, she was in the hospital a time or two, and so he felt that he should retire, and so they did retire. Uh, in retirement, they've had a tough time health-wise. It's been on and off, bad health. Just this past week, I believe it was, his wife was in the hospital, critically ill, and the word came to him that she was not going to make it. He's decided, I'm going to stand by her. I'm going to be there for her as I have. He went down to the hospital. He said, I'm going to go up where my wife is. I'm going to be with her. The hospital said, no, you can't go in. You're not going to be able to go and be with your wife. He said, listen, we have been married 65 years, and we have been beside one another for 65 years, and we're not going to stop now. I'm not going to let my wife die alone. You just as well decide one of two things. Either you're going to let me go and sit by the bedside of my dying wife, or you're going to move her to a hospital where I can, one or the other. And I'm not sure which one that, that happened, but he did get to go, and he sat with his wife. Folks, that's an illustration of love. Love is not just those giddy times that we had when we first got married. Love is not just those times when we have children or grandchildren, but love is that time when things are the toughest you still love and you still care. Now, the Apostle Paul said, you know, you can have all kinds of things. You can be an outstanding citizen. You can be an outstanding member of the church. You can just give all kinds of things for uh, the cause. But if you're not doing what you're doing in love, it counts for nothing. We need to be sure that our love is very real for our Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Dan Pauling was a leader in the, the religious life of America, and he was often away uh, doing various uh, jobs in his job. But on this one occasion, Dr. Pollen heard that his little boy was very ill and was going to the hospital. And so he went immediately to be with his little boy. The doctors came in and they said, your son's going to have to have surgery. We hate to tell you this, but he is going to have to have surgery. The little boy said, no, no, I'm not having surgery. And he constantly said, no, I'm not going to have surgery. Dr. Paulin talked to his boy and told him the absolute importance of having the surgery. Finally, the little boy said these words, Daddy, I'll have the surgery on one call that you promised me you'll stay by my side the whole time. Dr. Paulin said, I promised him. He said they came in, they did the preparation, they rolled my little boy out. I followed them to the, emergent, to the operating room. They told me, you can't go in. He said, listen, I promised my little boy that if he would have the surgery, I wouldn't leave his side. I'm going in. You just as well understand that. I'm not leaving him. And they decided, okay, and they let him go and be in the room where his little boy was having surgery. 
when the little boy was out of surgery and coming out of anesthesia, he looked up at his daddy and he said, Daddy, did you stay with me like you promised? Dr. Paulin said, wouldn't it have been something if I had to tell my little boy I didn't stay with him? You know, Jesus Christ tells us that we're to stay with the work. We're to stay with the job. We're to stay in love. Whatever we do, we're to do it in love. And it's not to be an artificial love. It's not to be a put on love, but it is to be a love that is from our heart. I remember a Peanuts cartoon where Schroeder was sitting at his uh, piano as he uh, often was in that cartoon. And Lucy, who had a crush on Schroeder but couldn't get a rise out of him for anything, asked him, Schroeder, do you even know what love is? Schroeder answers her with a dictionary example. He told her exactly what the dictionary said love was. Lucy was dejected. Her eyes dropped. She said, on paper, he's good, but not any other way. You know, love that's just on paper is not just love. It's just imitation. We need to be more than on paper in our love. We need to be absolutely sure about our love. You know, I think that there are a lot of people who uh, want things done for the cause of Christ and are really interested in seeing the kingdom of God progress, but they don't want to work. They want to delegate it to somebody else. They want to tell somebody else what to do. And very often that is the case. In every church, I guess there's always at least one who wants a lot of things done, but they don't want to do anything. They want somebody else to do it, and they'll uh, go around delegating uh, for somebody else to do what they think ought to be done. In one church, I remember, we had one person who was the chief delegator in that church. Fact is, it became so evident that she didn't do anything but delegate that when they saw her drive up with her car, the people in the office said, oh, oh somebody's got a lot they're going to have to do now because they knew she had something she wanted somebody else to do. But when she got up in the middle of the service to tell, it sounded like she had done it all. You know, we need to be very, very serious about our love for Christ, that it's not just a delegating love for somebody else, but we're to, to carry out our work and our labor for the Lord Jesus Christ. We uh, are living in a time when fewer and fewer people are being reached for Jesus Christ. Did you know that uh, uh, we are told that it takes 50 Southern Baptist Christians to win one person to Jesus Christ in a year? Isn't that a sad sort of thing that 50 Southern Baptists, 50 Christians to win one person in a year? It is a very serious matter. We live in a growing area. Uh, we, we live uh, in a time where 50% of our county is not church. 50% of our county is not church. And the other 50% that is church, a great part of them don't come to church. Do you stop and think about how many members of this church who never come to church, even though their name is on a church road? Greenville County has already been overrun with new people and they're flooding in all the time. I talked to a man who has just bought a house and moved to Spartanburg. And he told me that he worked in Greenville. I said, well, what in the world? If you have to drive to Greenville every day? He said, absolutely. He said, I tried to buy a house in Greenville. I could not afford a house in Greenville. There are too many people moving in. The houses are out, outrageous in cost and you can't find them. He said, we were told go to Spartanburg County. 
because you can get a nice home for a reasonable price in Spartanburg County. And he said, that's what I've done, and it's true. But let me tell you, you know what that says? That says the spillover from Greenville is now coming to Spartanburg, and we're going to see an explosion of population in our county. You say, well, it's not going to affect Inman. Let me tell you, have you noticed how many houses are being built in Inman? Have you noticed uh, how many uh, acres of land are being cleared in order to build houses? Inman is about to grow tremendously. And we are sitting in the middle of it as uh, Baptists, as Christians, as Inman Mills Baptist Church. And we need to decide whether we're going to reach out and reach people, not because we want a big church, but because we love them. And we want them to know the Lord. And we want to have fellowship with them. And we want to love them as our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Back in 1972, I was pastor of the Northside Baptist Church in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Had no desire to leave, had no plans to leave, but all of a sudden on a Sunday, a group of men occupied one pew. And of course we knew they were a pulpit committee. Just so happened, I didn't know who they were because I have never in all my ministry applied for a church. Every church I've been called to was not because I applied, but it was because of the Lord directing. I said, I don't know who they are. Just so happened my dad and my mother were visiting that day. Dad said, don't you know who that committee was? I said, no. He said, well, I'll find out. And so he came back to Spartanburg and he called me a few days later. He said, found out where they're from. They're from Boiling Springs First Baptist Church in Spartanburg. I said, well, didn't know that, and I'd planned uh, for them to come, didn't know it. They came. They came a second time. They talked to me. They said, Jack, we, we really think God wants you to come to Boiling Springs First Baptist. I said, well, I, I really don't know about that. I said, why? He said, we're sitting on a gold mine. We need somebody to come who's going to help us reach the people. They said, if you'll come, let us show you the community and how we're growing. I think you'll change your mind. They had me come over. We went over that community. My goodness, a tremendous community. And the houses that were being built, people were coming out of Spartanburg to, to be a part of Boiling Springs. At one time, Boiling Springs First Baptist was the largest rural church in the convention, but no longer was it going to be rural. It was going to be a suburban church. I looked at all that, and I said, Lord, is that what you want me to do? That's a tremendous job to come in that field. I told the committee, I said, the only way I will consider coming is that you promise me 12 men, a dozen men, who will commit themselves for two years to work with me to try to begin reaching these new people and that this church is not going to be a closed church, but it's going to be an open church where we'll reach all people. They said, we promise you. Well, you know, sometimes pulpit committees promise what they can't carry out, but they did do that. They gave me 12 men who were committed for two years to outreach and getting people. We work for two years. Let me tell you, some Sunday mornings after we had worked for some months, some Sunday mornings there'd be 10 people lined up out front wanting to join the church, waiting to be saved, be baptized. People were thrilled to death to see that the church was growing now and was multiplying. But you know who the happiest people were in that church? those 12 men who knew that they had a part in reaching out for our lives. These, these people did it out of love, and that's the only way we're going to reach lost people is to love them. You can't, you can't embarrass them. You can't criticize them, but you can love them. 
And we must decide in these days ahead if we're going to be a church that's going to reach out in love to touch people and invite them to be a part of our family. It's important. Let's think about three words I think are very important. The first word is, is love. Uh, the scripture tells us without love, nothing else is worth it. I'm thinking about Andre Krauss. You probably remember him as a great singer and a composer. His father called him one day and told him, Andre, you must remember that what you're doing is for the love of people, for the love of Christ. And whenever your success quits loving people and loving Christ, it's time to come home. You know, I thought about that. I thought about that, you know, when as a preacher we quit loving people, we quit loving Christ, it's time to go home. But it's the same way with deacons. It's the same way with Sunday school teachers. Same way with WMU. Whenever we quit loving people and loving Jesus, we just as well go home. We live in a time when we've got to express that love to reach people. I say number one is work. Uh, you know, this is not a favorite word today. Uh, we don't really care for work sometimes. We prefer somebody else to do the work. But I've, been a, I've been a part of the Southern Baptist Convention for many, many years, and they've come out with various programs along the way of how to reach people. And they, and they have you come for meetings, and maybe for a week you uh, look at the program. But the sad thing about it is everybody thought it was a program that didn't demand work. But when you get to the bottom of that program, it's work. You cannot, you cannot do the work of the Lord without being involved in work. The early disciples were men who were not extraordinary, but they were just willing to do the job that was at hand. A willingness to work because of love is half of the battle. When people recognize that we're not coming to them for some other purpose, but that we love and care about them, then it makes us to be somebody that is truly being used of the Lord. There is a second word that's important in serving Christ in love, and that's vision. Robert Schuller uh, wrote several books, and I've never bought but one of them. I'm not impressed with uh, his theology by any means, but the title of that book was Tough Times Never Last, But Tough People Last. And I thought that was an uh, intriguing kind of title. So I bought that book, and the price of the book was uh, made worthy by one illustration. He told about the Hotel El Cortez in San Diego, California. It was a great hotel. It was a hotel that was attracting tremendous business. As a matter of fact, the elevators in the hotel were so overworked that they were going to have to get other elevators for the hotel. And so they had engineers and architects to come in, and they were in the big, beautiful lobby of that hotel. And they were looking up, and they were talking about how big a hole they were going to have to cut in the ceiling of that lobby and cut through every floor of that hotel in order to put another elevator in. A janitor, as they often do, was standing by listening, uh, sort of listening in on the, on the conversation. After they heard what the architects and engineers were talking about, he said, I know a better way what you're going to do is make a mess. This is going to be a mess down here when you cut through all of that. He said, and not only that, you're going to have to close the hotel for a while. He said, I got a better idea. I can imagine these uh, architects and engineers were a little bit irritated that the janitor was telling them that he had a better idea than they had. But finally they said, okay, what's your idea? 
He said, I'd put an elevator on the outside wall of the hotel. Nobody had ever done that before. There was not an outside elevator. He said, but that's what I would do, and it would save you a whole lot of time and a whole lot of mess, and you'd be able to keep the hotel open. They thought about it. They said, well, we're going to try it. And so the first outside elevator was put in at Hotel El Cortez at San Diego. Vision. Vision is important. Uh, we, we need to know what God wants done, and we can only find that uh, with vision. I, I remember, what, 15 years ago, we had a great desire for uh, a family life center here at Inman Mill, but we didn't have any money. And so the idea came up, well, we'll just borrow the money. Uh, well, the borrowing of the money was going to be a big deal, and the congregation thought about it and prayed about it, and the congregation said, no, we won't approve of building a family life center and borrowing all the money. Uh, this was a disappointing thing for many people, but the church went ahead. We began raising money. Uh, finally, you see out the back door what's taking place. God had a plan, and it was a better plan than ours. And we're going we're gonna to see very shortly the fruit of following the leadership of the Lord. We need to always be aware that God has the best plan, and we need to seek the plan of God. Not only do we have work and vision, but if we're going to be successful as a church in these crucial days, we must center everything on prayer. We must seek the Lord's will. Great ideas, great work, great visions, and great victory all come from prayer. Joseph Haydn, a great composer, was about to sit down to compose again when some people came to him and said, how do you do your compositions? How, how do you come about them? And Haydn said, when I sit down, I begin to pray and I ask the Lord for inspiration. He said, I pray and I pray. And if the Lord gives me that inspiration, I begin to compose. But if he doesn't, what do you do? He said, well, I wait and I pray again. You know, that's good advice for all of us. And that is whenever we find that we're in need of doing the work of the Lord, we need to pray. We need to saturate what we do with prayer. We seek the Lord with love as our motive, work and vision and prayer as our method, love vision, work, and prayer. The secret to accomplishing what God wants us to do. I tell you, this church has an awful lot to offer to the people who are going to move into this community. If they want a church where love is found, if they want a church where faith is found, if they want a church where family is treasured, you've got it. I don't know of a church that has more love for the people than this church does. We just need to let people know that we love them and we want them. Surely that's our desire in the days to come. I thank you so much for being here. Thank you for letting me share a burden of my heart that the Lord laid upon me this week to share with you. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation. If you're here this morning and you would make a decision relative to your spiritual life, maybe you want to become a part of this church and you want to join. Maybe you need to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to come acknowledging Christ. We invite you to come. Or if there is another thing that is on your heart, we invite you to come and share with us. We have Ron Fine, our chairman of deacons, over here. He will meet you, and then he'll share you with me, and we'll be joyful if you have a decision. Let's stand and sing just as I am.
for meeting with us today. Would you dismiss each of these in the awareness that you love them most of all? And we'll thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen.